Well, welcome back to another video Bible study as we continue in the life of Christ. And today we're looking at the passage of the Lord with his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane. This is uh, in Mark. We've been going through John 15, 16, and 17. And now we're going to go to the Gospel of Mark chapter 14, where there's a detailed uh, account in Mark's Gospel of the events in the Garden of Gethsemane. So let's have a, a word of prayer, and then we'll commit this study to the Lord. So Father, thank you that we can open your word. Thank you, Lord, for this account, and help us to appreciate uh, what the Lord, our Savior, uh, was willing to go to and, and the anguish that he had in the garden so that we may have relationship with you and and hope and assurance. So, Father, just help us to appreciate it and open our hearts and our eyes to your word, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're going to Mark chapter 14. Now the Lord had gone through that long journey, so he had um, had the uh, time with the disciples in the upper room, and even the what we call the Last Supper, that was at the end of a long, long day when he had told the disciples to go make uh, preparations for the meal and them having all the things and, and preparations and doing everything that they needed to do. And then the Lord saying that one of them would betray him, Judas getting up and leaving, all that was all part of the same night. And as they left the upper room, they walked through the temple courts, and they went down across the Kidron Valley, and now they'd come into the Garden of Gethsemane. So we're going to look at that, and uh, as we do so, we need to realize that um, the disciples themselves physically were exhausted, as anyone would be. This would have been now pretty well early in the morning when uh, all this was occurring, and so the Lord goes from this event to Judas finally uh, with the Sanhedrin coming to arrest Christ that we'll look at next week. But in Mark chapter 14, we're going to go from uh, verse 32 to verse 42 and look at that passage. So let me just pull up the passage now and let's look at what the Word of God says. It says, And they came to a place called Gethsemane. Now, what is interesting is John's gospel calls it the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, Mark just calls it Gethsemane. So what does that mean? Well, it literally means the olive press. This sits on the lower slope of the Mount of Olives. Now, the Mount of Olives was uh, the place where the Lord did all the wonderful teaching of what we call the Olivet Discourse. The Olivet Discourse, or the Conversation on the Mount of Olives, is where the Lord foretold uh, how the destruction of Jerusalem would come about, how he told them the signs that they were to look for before the destruction would occur, which did uh, 40 years down the road from that night, 40, year, 40 years down the road when the Romans came in. But he also talked about the signs and the events preceding his second coming, which is, you know, now 2,000 some years later. So in that amazing passage in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21, the Lord gave the teaching on the Olivet Discourse, and that was the conversation on the Mount of Olives before he went into Jerusalem and before he had the Last Supper. Now he'd come out of Jerusalem and he'd come down through the valley called the Kidron Valley and just a little ways up onto the uh, shoulder of the lower slope of the Mount of Olives. So let me pull up a map here. It will better describe what has happened here. And in this map, what we do see is a better understanding of exactly the things and where they were located. So the Mount of Olives is there and you will see the Garden of Gethsemane. And in that garden, what we have is an area that they would, would have used to press the olives that they took from the olive trees uh, higher up on the hill, up onto the Mount of Olives, and they would have brought it down. 
And then in this garden area on the lower slope, uh, there would have been a press where they would have uh, poured the olives in and there would have been some sort of a large um, press. Maybe it was used with some sort of an animal that would have walked in a circle and just squeezed down the olives and made the olive oil, which was so important, not only for the people of Israel, but it was one of the main exports uh, at this time in, in the land as they exported to other countries. So here in the garden, late at night, the Lord was there with his 11. Now remember, 12 is the normal amount of the apostles, but Judas had already left them. And it says here, let's go back to the text. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. So the intention was that the Lord needed to go to some place that was a familiar place where he could go and pray with him. Now, we're going to look at later how Judas arrives. Now, what is interesting about that is that late at night, probably early in the morning, actually, Judas knew where to find Jesus when he came with the Sanhedrin to have Jesus arrested. And we read that, indeed, it was a location that was familiar to the Jewish people. And it was a place where the Lord himself often went with his disciples. So it was a, it was a location where Judas knew if we're going to find Jesus, he'll be in the Garden of Gethsemane. And sure enough, he was. Whether he went there often to pray or to find a place quiet uh, that was beautiful, where he could sit with his disciples and teach them. So now he says to his disciples, sit here while I pray, with the intention of him going off and spending some quiet time in a very familiar place to pray with his disciples. And then it says, and he took with him Peter, James, and John. Now, of the 12, the Lord had what we call the inner four, which was Peter, Andrew, James, and John, two sets of brothers. But of those four, he did only take three of the four. He didn't take Andrew up on the Mount of Transfiguration. He took Peter, James, and John, because ultimately he knew that Peter, James, and John were the leaders of the apostles and were going to be the foundation for the establishment of the church. So he has 11 disciples here, and out of the 11, he leaves eight of them somewhere on the outside, somewhere near the garden gate, and he takes the inner three of the disciples. He took Peter, James, and John, the three who also were brought before the Lord and were taken with him onto the Mount of Transfiguration, where they could see the Lord in his all of his glory. They saw Jesus transfigured or changed in his form. They heard the voice of of God the Father, saying, this is my son, listen to him. And so now those three were now also privileged to leave the other group and go with the Lord further into the garden area, closer to where he would pray. But the thing is, they were not having a prayer meeting with Jesus. It wasn't that, so you eight stay here, and us four, you know, the, the Jesus and the other three, we're going to go have our own little prayer meeting. That's not what happened. It was eight on the outside, three closer to Jesus so they could watch, and then the Lord himself. Now, the important thing to remember here, that he chose those three to come for the same reason he chose those three to go with them on the Mount of Transfiguration. They were there to observe, to see, to appreciate the importance of the event. They had done that on the Mount of Transfiguration, and they were changed. They, they had a new understanding of who the Lord was. And now the idea is, you're going to come with me, and you're going to watch as I spend this very intimate time with my Father, and anguish uh, 
comes out of me as I understand what is ahead of me. You need to see and understand so that this will make an impact into your life as the events of the day unfold and as the uh, fact of my crucifixion occurs and as you understand the spiritual impact of what is coming. So they came to observe. They came to sit afar and yet see the things that were occurring. So let's go back to the text again. And he took with him Peter, James, and John, and no one says, and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. Now, the idea here, when it says distressed and troubled, the actual translation is he was ringed in trouble. So it's the idea, not that he had a, he had a bad night or he, he was upset, but literally he was encompassed. He was ringed in sorrow, in trouble, in distress. Now the answer is, why would that be? Well, let's continue on and we'll deal with the whole uh, reaction that the Lord has. And he says to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here, and here's the key, watch. That's what they were there for. They were there to watch. And so, as the Lord tells his disciples, he says, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. And he was, he was wrapped in distress and in trouble. Now, you could say, why? I mean, the Lord came to die on the cross, the Lord came to be our sacrifice. Well, do remember that he was 100% human being. He was a complete human being, and yet at the same time, he was completely God. So when we look at the reasoning for this sorrow and this distress, it wasn't because, it was not because he was so worried about the means of his physical death. It wasn't that he was sorrowful because of the fact that he was going to suffer or because they were going to spit on him or because they were going to beat him or they were going to mock him or whip him. And ultimately, they were going to nail him in a horribly horrific means of public execution. It wasn't the physical to which he's addressing here when his soul is in distress, when he's encompassed with trouble. So what is it then? Well, let me pull up some other scriptures and then we can better understand. 2 Corinthians 5.21, the apostle Paul tells us this, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that he might be made the righteousness of God so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And so Paul, the apostle Paul tells us that God the Father made him, that being Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin. So, the Lord Jesus here, who is fully God and still in eternity past maintained his complete essence of holiness, now on earth still maintaining that essence of holiness, and yet God in human flesh. And even in the human flesh, he never sinned. He was tempted in every way as we, yet without sin. And so now what is so disturbing him, what is so anguishing him is that he is going to be put under the subject of the work and the effects of Satan's rebellion. He's going to be humbled to the point of having to bear the effects of what Satan did in that Satan brought sin into the world. And Christ would now have to bear under it. He would have to feel the effects of the work of the fallen angel. Now, that in itself, horrific. But now, even more than that, he was actually 
going to absorb or be laid upon him, bear for us my sin, the consequences of my sin. And so when we read in 1 John that Christ Jesus is the propitiation of our sins, it means that he is the bearer of the just wrath of God, bearing the consequence of what I deserve upon himself. And so the Lord Jesus is realizing now that what is ahead of him is bearing the weight of the sin of all of God's elect throughout all of ages would be falling upon Christ. It wasn't simply that Jesus would die on the cross to make salvation possible. It was rather that Jesus died bearing the weight and the penalty and the wrath of his Father for the sins of his people. He actually took my sins upon him on the cross. He took the wrath that I deserve that should send me to hell fell upon Christ, not just for one single individual, but for all of God's people throughout all of the ages. He was going to be brought to the lowest point where all of the weight of the separation of his heavenly father from him was going to be laid on him. Remember that verse we studied in discipleship, Isaiah 59, 2, where it says, our sins have separated us from God. And so the Lord Jesus now realize, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He is going to feel the effects of the sin laid upon him and then bear that wrath of his Holy Father so that you and I, who know Christ as our Savior, can honestly be called the redeemed purchased by the blood of Christ, justified in his blood. It's an amazing concept. And so when the Lord Jesus realized that he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might become the righteous or the holy ones of God, that realization of what was ahead of him and the the weight and the penalty that was awaiting him, not from Satan, not from the Romans, not from the Jews, but from his heavenly Father who was holy and had to, had to punish that which violated his holiness. Let's look at uh, another passage, one of that we know quite well from the Old Testament. Isaiah 53, verse 5 and 6 says this, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastement that brought us peace. By his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned each, every one, to his own way. And the Lord, that being capital L-O-R-D, God the Father, has laid on him, that being Jesus, the iniquity of us all. And so here it is, the prophecy from Isaiah, that the iniquity would be laid upon Christ, that he would be carrying and crushed with the transgressions and the consequences of my sin. Now, the idea, when you start to comprehend that, when you start to realize what weight of your sin Christ bore on the cross for you so that you could be called the children of God. Then you realize how ridiculous this concept of I get to heaven by my good works is. <laughs> because that, no, that is so opposite, so inferior to what the Lord did. It has nothing to do with my labor. It has to do fully upon that the Lord Jesus bore the wrath of, of his heavenly father that should have been directed to me, that would send me to an eternity of hell, 
Rather, Christ bore it upon himself. Who, he who knew no sin became sin for us. And it's that understanding, it is that concept, it is that reality that the Lord Jesus was now wrestling with. And he knew that this is what he had to, to bear. It was not the penalty of crucifixion that he was so disturbed about, but rather it was the horror of feeling sin upon himself who had never tasted sin and was only the consequence of Satan's work. But he became, as old commentaries talk about, he became our second Adam. If you read older commentaries, they'll talk about Adam being your federal head, meaning he represents you. So when Adam fell and became sin, so you also, when you are born, David says, surely I've been sinful from the time my mother conceived me. All of that is because Adam is our federal head. He represents me by being sinful man. Now the Lord Jesus becomes our federal head, our second Adam, in that he redeemed me from that and brought me new life. And he brought me righteousness again. And so when you come to salvation in Christ, we say, and you will read in older commentaries, that Jesus is our federal head. He represents me because he rose victorious, sinless in victory, and that is your new state in Christ because of the fact that he became sin who knew no sin. All right, let's go back to the passage here and read what would happen now. It says this, And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and he prayed. If it were possible, the hour might pass from him. Now, we do have to realize he knew that was the reason to which he came. But there was a human horror of the spiritual consequences of what was ahead. And he was saying, Lord, if there's any other way this can occur, any other way, please don't let me have to suffer the wrath of God. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible to you. Remove this cup from me. And not that I will, but that you will. And so there's a, there's a very intimate pleading. You know, the Lord only talked to his heavenly Father as Abba once, and this is the time. Now, later on in scriptures, we do have scriptures that talk about that we can come to the Lord in our time of need and cry out Abba, and we also have that the Spirit of God within us cries out Abba. Abba is a very intimate word. Jesus never referred prior to this to relationship with his heavenly father by saying Abba. It's literally what a young child says to their father. It has that demonstrative ending, kind of like calling you Tommy or Susie. You know, it's like Abba. So it has that demonstrative ending to it. It's literally the same as saying Daddy. And so here Jesus is crying out in that very simple, uh, realistic way to his Father, identifying with the intimacy that he has in the Trinity. And he's saying, Abba, Lord, Daddy, please, if there's any way that this can happen some other way, so I don't have to bear the penalty. But then he does say, but not my will, O Lord, but your will. He knew he had come to do the will of his father. He was pleading. But you can see the genuine horror and the thoughts of what he was bearing upon his mind. Back to the text. Verse 37. And he came and found them sleeping. Now, 
there's much to say about this because, first of all, the only reason he had brought the inner three with him was so that just like on the Mount of Transfiguration, they could stand afar, watch, and appreciate. They could appreciate who Jesus is and what he was about to do. And they're sleeping. They didn't see any of that. They didn't see the crying out to God. They didn't see the the the, the genuineness of his sorrow. It wasn't just simply they didn't understand it. They were asleep. They missed it all. It, could you imagine if they had slept through the, the, the Mount of Transfiguration? And now here they are sleeping through the Lord crying out to his father in declaring that he is the sin bearer, the one who would bear the wrath of God, the be the propitiation for our sins, and they're asleep. Now you can say, well, you know what? It's been a massively long day, and they've been walking all day, and they've had this meal, and da 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 And so there is a sense in which you want to give them a little bit of, you know, give them a give them a little bit of a break here because of the fact that, you know, it's probably one or two in the morning and they're exhausted. Yeah, but that wasn't it. They were brought in to see something that would change and form their ministry for years to come, to see the anguish of the Lord Jesus in their life, and they were asleep. They missed it. And so look what the Lord says. He says to them this, and he said Peter to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Which seems to indicate that the Lord had gone and had gone through this prayer, was crying out to God for at least an hour. And when he comes back, they're asleep. Notice he calls him Simon. Now that's interesting because he doesn't call him Peter. He calls him Simon. The name that he used for Peter before he really recognized the spiritual impact of Peter. That in itself is a rebuke. When you look in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, Peter's called Peter or Cephas, but not Simon anymore because there's a different level of spiritual maturity. Simon is his unsaved name. Simon is his, his immature name. And so the Lord says, Simon, that's a rebuke. I expected better from you, Peter. And so I'm going to address you with the name you had when you had no understanding. Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch for one hour? And then he warns them, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The temptation here may be of sleep, but certainly in a greater scope, temptation as a whole. The spirit is willing. The flesh is weak. Now, why did the Lord say that? What he's saying is this. We can lose out in seeing the great blessings of God in our lives when we fall into temptation because of giving in to the flesh. And that is a tragedy that all of us really need to work on. When we fall into temptations of the flesh, and we can make justifications for it maybe, but when we fall into temptations of the flesh, we miss out on seeing some of the great blessings that God has for you in your life. And that's exactly what happened. When they were brought to watch, they were brought in to observe, they were brought in to see this event of history, and they fell asleep. So back to the text. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. In other words, he left the three, he left... Peter, James, and John, and he goes back deeper into the garden, and he cried out to God again. 
And he brought the same anxiety and the same pleas to God, asking the Lord to, to not have to carry the weight of all the righteous individuals, of all the redeemed. And then it says, and again, he came. So he, he's finished however long he was, we don't know. But after a period of time of praying a second time, he comes back out to the three and they're sleeping again. For their eyes were very heavy. And they did not know what to answer him because they're like, yeah, sorry, Lord. And he came a third time, meaning he went back in to pray again. And a third time he comes out. And it says, and he came a third time and said to them, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Now, what is interesting is here, Peter will fall asleep three times maybe an hour and a half later, maybe two hours later, he will deny Christ three times. And so weak the human flesh is, so weak the human uh, fallen nature is. We say, and Peter just literally, it was probably two hours earlier that Peter had said, Lord, I'll die for you. And now here he is, asleep and missing the event of history, seeing the Lord Jesus acknowledging that he would be the sin bearer for the redeemed of all time, acknowledging that he has come to be that, uh, that great uh, individual who will uh, carry the weight of my sin to allow me to be declared righteous before a holy God. And he missed it all. He fell asleep. And soon he's going to deny the Lord three times. But you know what? It is through the failures of Peter that we can be encouraged to know the Lord didn't cast him aside. In fact, Peter went on to, to be the foundation of, and the really the basis of the New Testament church. So there are many times in your life where we fail the Lord where we fall asleep, where we do things that we wonder how in the world could a Christian act like that. But the Lord doesn't discard us. Not at all. And Peter can serve as an example to encourage you to stay strong and to return to the Lord so that there's still a great future of what Christ can do in your life. All right, let's go back. Closing at the verse 42, Jesus says, it is enough. <laughs> you know, I, I prayed enough and you guys have fallen asleep enough. Uh, you know, you're not, you're not even doing what I brought you here to do. It is enough. The hours come. The son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise. Let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. So Jesus knew that Judas was now on the way. He didn't run. He could have said, Judas is coming. Let's get out of here. But he didn't. Let me pull up a scripture here just to show you what I had mentioned earlier. It's found in John chapter 18, verse 2. It says, Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, that being the Garden of Gethsemane, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So that explains why Judas was so easy to find Jesus when he brought the Roman soldiers to have Christ arrested. Judas knew where he was. Judas says, I know where Jesus goes. He goes to the garden. He goes to the garden of Gethsemane. That's where we always go. That's where, that's a common place for us to sit and, and rest and be refreshed and be, and for the Lord to talk with us. That's where he'll be. Let's go get him. And so certainly we have that explanation in John that that's why Judas was so uh, quick to go and so uh, he found him so easily. And the Lord says, you know, the betrayer's here. He knew that this is now the beginning of the path that was required. He had come to do the will of his father. He had pleaded with all truthfulness that he did not want to bear the penalty of my sins. And I understand that. <laughs> 
I don't. I wouldn't want to bear the penalty of my sins in any form or fashion. And yet Christ pleaded, Lord, if there's any other way. But then he knew, no, I, this is what I've come to do. I have to be a substitute lamb and provide salvation for the redeemed. And so sure enough, Christ now acknowledges the time has come. Let things start the way they have to be. You know, when we look at this passage, we really see the, the, the humanity of Christ and how the realization of what sin is and how horrible sin is, that even though he had always been destined to come and to be my substitute and to die and to, and to uh, uh, um, be the one that would hang on the cross, now understanding not just dying on the cross, that's one thing, but, uh, but having to take upon himself the wrath that the redeemed of the Lord deserve, having to be my propitiation, the one who would bear the consequences of the holy wrath of God so that every aspect of my life would be forgiven. Christ has died. He has risen. He is reigning. And as a result of all of that, we today can be assured that you are loved with a, with a level of love that is within the Trinity. He loves you like he loves his Father, and he loves his Father with that incredible, inseparable love. And now we today are assured that nothing can separate us from that love because indeed that salvation was so strong, so secure, so absolute, there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. So be blessed and encouraged this week. We may feel discouraged, but you need to understand the Lord did this so that you can have a relationship with the Eternal Father for eternity. All right, Lord bless you, and we'll look forward to looking at this passage on Sunday.